John Ogden is a co-founder at Uplift Kids, a lesson library and curriculum that helps families nurture spiritual health. He is also the author of the book, When Mormons Doubt, A Way to Strengthen Relationships and Live a Quality Life, and has a bachelor's degree in English, literature, and a master's in writing and rhetoric from Brigham Young University. He writes at johnogden.com and lives with his spouse and two kids in Provo, Utah. John Ogden. Thanks, Carl, and thanks for all you've done for the conference. So religion, the future of religion is an API. I could start by telling you that an API is an application programming interface, but that is boring and it doesn't really clarify much. Uh, so I'll just give an example. You hop into an Uber and you pull up the map, say where you want to go, and the API here is, uh, at least as of 2018, uh, Google Maps API. And so Uber's app ports in data from Google Maps, and then that's how you get around in an Uber. Some people have uh, given the metaphor of a waiter. So you order the food, the waiter then goes to the kitchen, and then brings the food back to you. And so you can port whatever information you have. Basically, it's plug and play. That's the simple definition. So that's an API. APIs have grown in popularity tremendously since 2005, and there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one, they, they help programmers build on what's already been created. You can tell in the instance of Uber, they didn't want to go and map the entire planet before they could build their app. Right, and so they just paid 58 million in that case uh, for the ability to port in Google's data. And uh, they also connect separate technologies in a single interface. You could potentially bring in just dozens of APIs into a single interface and create something completely new based on the integration. And they enable speed and innovation. So back to the future of religion is it an API. I'm gonna tell, the same thing, rather than define what I mean, I'll just give an example. This is one example, it's not the only example, but uh, there's a story from the Dalai Lama, and a reporter came to him and he said, uh, what would he say to Americans that w who want to become Buddhists? And the Dalai, Dalai Lama, in this case, said, don't bother. He said, learn from Buddhism if that's good for you, but do it as a Christian, a Jew, or whatever you are. So. Again, that's not the only way to live. I don't think his answer is the, is the right answer for everybody, but I do think it's an interesting idea. He's saying that, uh, as I understand it, you have your own cultural context, and if you're gonna flip your entire cultural context, that might be drastic. There might be downsides to that. And so he said, what if you kept your cultural context and you ported in ideas from other cultural contexts into your own? So in this case, you know, you have a Christian who's in the Christian cultural context and then ports in Buddhist principles into their Christian cultural context. That's the metaphor I'm using. Yeah, it doesn't have to be only here. You could have like a non-believer uh, and you could say, you know, a non-believer could use Sam Harris's waking up app and then they could port in uh, Buddhism and keep their culture as a, as a secular person uh, but be porting in various religions. This could also be somebody who ports in ideas from Christianity, even, as, even if they remain secular. So another story <clears throat> from another perspective is uh, this idea of somebody coming to uh, somebody, a uh, Buddhist named Ghassan, and they proposed reading the Christian Bible, and he said, read it to me. Read me the Christian Bible. And so the person read him a passage from Jesus, and he said... Uh, you know, this passage, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow should take thought for the things of itself. And Ghassan said, whoever uttered those words, I consider it an enlightened man. And so in this case, it's a Buddhist cultural context pulling from Christianity. And so whatever the cultural context, you know, you can port in uh, lots of different cultural contexts into your own and this can become a religious experience in and of itself where it's personalized and decentralized in many cases. But in some cases, uh, this is the way religion has always been. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's distinct and what I'm referring to here. But first I'll talk about what's the same. So here's an example, uh, Egyptian god that has been cast in Greco-Roman cultural context, right? 
And so this is very ancient. There's so many examples of this. It, you look at any archaeology, and it's like every single piece of archaeology that's right next to another religion, they start blending their architectural, uh, what do you say? They start blending their architecture. And so you can see it's called, in academic circles, it's called syncretism, and it's all over the place. And it's even uh, very common in contemporary time, in contemporary circles. So here's an example of uh, LD, uh, LDS or Christian theology being syncretized with uh, secular American identity where the, the founding fathers are almost like as a role of the apostles right behind Jesus, Jesus holding the con constitution. It's just these two cultures that are kind of weaving together in this instance. Uh, in Mormon specific contexts, LDS General Conference they're, they will cite Shakespeare, they'll, sh they'll cite C.S. Lewis. These are pulling from outside. They're porting in uh, Christian and uh, literary examples into Mormonism. So it's very common. And one final one I'll give is EFY music. Uh, some subset of Mormons heard Christian rock and thought, oh, we need some of that. And so they ported that in uh, to Mormonism. Um, and, and which Christian rock is already porting in rock music, and you know, rock music is already porting in. You know, you can trace back the lineage. Um, nevertheless, it's it's common, and I think it's only going to become more common throughout the future of religion, because we live in an increasingly connected world. So, 500 years ago, you know, if you're a farmer, you have a local church, you might not really encounter other religious views your whole life. And so you just have, this is the church I go to, and this is, this is kind of all I know is my locality. But we're completely connected today. And so <clears throat> the future of religion is a process of integrating whatever's of good report or anything that's praiseworthy, right? Wherever it might surface. In... Uh, this local community, we, we still have a bit of an aversion to Eastern philosophies, but I see that uh, decreasing rapidly, that, that aversion. I think that people are becoming more and more interested in meditation, mindfulness, Buddhism, Stoicism. And so it's only a matter of time, it might have been before, uh, before in LDS General Conference, people are, are pulling from these traditions more overtly. Um, <clears throat> The, there's so much wisdom throughout the world, the Bhagavad Gita, there's a few of my favorites, the Bhagavad Gita from Hinduism, Mary Oliver's poetry, Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations, the Tao Te Ching is another one. And the future of religion then is a matter of porting these in. And this is what I'm, I'm doing professionally is like figuring out how to port in these various wisdom traditions so that they're digestible and so families can can use them in their home, and they can take uh, whatever wisdom traditions that they want to explore, let's explore Buddhism together, or let's explore Hinduism together, and let's bring that in, whether they happen to be Mormon, whether they happy to, happen to be Christian, whether they happen to be secular, uh, it's a matter of using, using the various world wisdom traditions to have a richer religious life. In conclusion, the, the reason for this is that Again, we live in a connected world. And just to say, like, I'm going to only, only interact with the ideas that are here in my locality, you know, I happen to be from Provo, is very limiting in the 21st century, where we really have to be able to be part of a culture. This is what the Dalai Lama was getting at. You know, be part of a culture, be part of your local community, but bring in a global perspective. That's really what I'm talking about when I say the future of religion is an API. Thanks. We've got time for a few questions. Sure, Brian. Thanks, John. Um, quick question. So what kind of APIs or services can the Latter-day Saint Church provide or Mormonism provide to others? It's a good question. I think that they have like their apps that they've already developed, and so being able to port out, uh, I'll just say, I think that a lot of the strengths in Mormonism are around com community innovations. 
like how to gather together as communities. And so I don't know how that would look to port out uh, that, those ideas of community exactly. Uh, I'll have to think about that more. I find it compelling, but I don't know exactly what it would look like. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So do you have like a rule of recognition in terms of what is safe to port in and what you want to firewall the Quran, you know? What, what would a Muslim not want from Christianity? What would a Christian not want from Islam? Do you have a, like a rule of recognition? I do. Uh, there are several principles that I, I personally follow. One is like wisdom is paradoxical. Uh, God is human, human is God. Um, the Tao Te Ching says that um, there's darkness upon darkness is the, the answer to all mystery. And so there are these paradoxes that define wisdom. And so that's one thing. Another thing is timelessness. Um, there, there are several criteria that uh, I personally use and, and use through Uplift to determine, well, what is wisdom? Because I can become very murky. Uh, but really, it would come down to a person could say, I disagree with, you know, they, they might disagree with me. Uh, but we would have transparency on what we consider wisdom and what is not wisdom, um, and then, yeah, follow that. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you respond to my, my, my friend's criticism when, when I told, I, he told me he'd slept with so many women he couldn't remember it. It's, 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 he was certain European when I was in graduate school, and I said, well, wow, I'm a mon, mon you know, I only had one wife, and he said, oh, You've experienced something, something that I'll never experience. In other words, the problem of syncretism mm -hmm. is that you lose in the syncretic moment the actual particularity that is pure. And so how do you, you seem to be promoting syncretism, but you don't seem to be saying there's a loss in any syncretism. Yeah, there is a loss in any syncretism. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> absolutely there's a loss. Uh, community gets diluted, and it, there's a big loss in it, a big trade-off. Um, and so I, I am not saying that I believe that this is, um, that my interpretation of religion is the right way. Um, and I've experienced that loss personally, and it really hurts. I, I, so I, I do acknowledge the trade-off. I just don't see how the current state of things is sustainable if we just double down on locality and parochialism. And so that's where the tension is. I, we have to grow to have a global perspective while figuring out how to, how to enact it at a local level. It's a very, very difficult transition, but I think it is the the way that the world is headed, and so I think we have to figure out how to navigate those waters. Yeah. So, game theoretically, marginal intolerances can come to dominate entire markets. Mm -hmm. You know, we think about halal yeah. or kosher food uh, becomes a preference that most mm -hmm. people don't have, but you can always find it available. And I think there's a good argument that the reason that Christianity historically dominated where it did was because it was mutually intolerant of other religions. Mm -hmm. But clearly syncretism has flourished. So what is the difference between a period in which syncretism is an adaptive behavior versus when it is going to be a failing behavior and something else is going to take over the market, as it were? Hmm. Could you restate that? <laughs> Why does syncretism win today out over other propositions? Hmm. I really like this question. I'm trying to figure out how to best answer it. Um, I want to say that it's because we're in a time of peace. <laughs> 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 that uh, we have like the flexibility and freedom to explore. Um, Christianity won out in large part because of um, Constantine, like just dominating. It became the Holy Roman Emperor. You know, if, if that wouldn't have happened, would Christianity still be around? I don't know. 
Uh, so in a time of peace like this, we have the freedom to be able to explore things. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question at all. <laughs> yeah, food for thought, yeah. Any others? Final one? Yeah. Just one, wanted to hear your thoughts on the kind of syncretism that you're talking about and that tradition in Mormonism with like, say for instance, Joseph Smith mentioning accept all truth, let it mm -hmm. come from whence yeah. it may. Yes, yeah, uh, that's exactly it. I think it, I think it possibly is it, precisely Mormon. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs>